So I am just delighted, delighted to welcome the Western Writers of America to this virtual festival. Um, we are so happy you guys can make it. Um, just a little bit of background, um, WWA was founded in 1953 to promote the literature of the American West and to recognize the best in Western writing with the prestigious Spur Award and the Western Writers Hall of Fame. If you're looking for something good to read, check out the Spur Award winner. Um, like the Western landscape itself, WWA and the books, songs, and stories produced by its members have evolved immensely. WWA boasts historians, nonfiction authors, young adult, romance writers, songwriters, poets, and screenwriters for film and television, with their work represented in every medium set in the ever-changing American West. This panel includes Los Angeles Times best-selling author and Spur Award winner the winner, uh, Deanne Stillman, award-winning historical fiction author Mark C. Jackson, Western author J.R. Sanders, and the, pod, uh, the panel's moderator will be Emmy Award-winning screenwriter and former president of WWA, Kirk Ellis. And please stick around. There's going to be a brief um, question and answer after you hear, you know, this, this uh, panel. You're going to want to um, ask questions. And Here's back to Jennifer to introduce Kirk. Thank you, Marnie. So Kirk, if you could just raise, our, raise your hand for everyone so they know who you are. Welcome. Kirk Ellis is the past president of Western Writers of America. He received both the WWA Spur Award that Marnie talked about and the Wrangler Award from the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum for his episode of the TNT DreamWorks miniseries, Into the West. Hopefully you can still get that and check it out. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Ellis won two Emmy Awards, a Humanist Prize. My apologies. A Humanist Prize for his work as writer and co-executive producer on the HBO miniseries, John Adams, which was also amazing. Wonderful. Um, I'm so sorry. Well, you can stop there. It gets embarrassing. <laughs> well, the miniseries won a record-breaking 13 Emmys. No, I'm going to keep going. In total, as well as four Golden Globe Awards. Previously, Ellis received an Emmy nomination and won the WGA Award and Humanities Prize for the ABC miniseries uh, Anne Frank, which he wrote and co-produced. Miniseries on which he has served as writer and producer have garnered more than 50 Emmy nominations. With Brian Cranston in IATV Studios, Ellis is executive producer and showrunner for a great improvisation based on the book by Stacey Schiff, which chronicles Benjamin Franklin's efforts to negotiate a treaty with France at the height of the American Revolution. For history, there's a little bit more. He is writing a limited series about General Douglas MacArthur's years in Japan mm. and Korea. Wow. Upcoming motion. I know, right? He's so amazing. We're so excited. I'm kind of like... I'm not the attraction here, though. The writers are, so, you know. <laughs> I know you are, but, like, it's just so cool that you all are here. So I want to give you proper credit. So upcoming motion picture projects include Age of Reason, based on an incident in the life of Thomas Paine, and the bilingual feature El Democrata, the story of Mexican revolutionary hero Francisco Madero. A former co-governor of the Writers Branch of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Ellis served for four years as chairman of the Santa Fe, New Mexico Arts Commission, and today serves as trustee for the Museum of New Mexico Foundation. And now, Kirk, I wow. will let you introduce the panelists. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks. So Unusual for a moderator to get that kind of intro when really <laughs> the, uh, the meat is in the writers themselves, and we've got a, a very diverse panel here. So. In all fairness, I want to, you know, and welcome everybody in the Zoom sphere. Thanks for, you know, listening in and watching this. It's, it's great that we can actually talk this way in a, the midst of the pandemic. So um, I want to start with, um, and these are all friends of mine, but I'll start with my friend Deanne Stillman, uh, who is the uh, most recently the author of a terrific book that puts a new spin on the, the friendship between Buffalo Bill Cody and Sitting Bull called Blood Brothers. Um, as was mentioned in, in the intro, she's also the Spur Award winning author of a book called Desert Reckoning, which tells the shocking and amazing true story of a crime in the Mojave Desert uh, that was inspired by her own Rolling Stone article. 
Um, and she's also the author of, of two very interesting books, Mustang and Desert Reckoning, which was praised by no less a literary critic than the amazing Hunter S. Thompson. So that's D.M. Stillman. Uh, D.M., just raise your hand there. I think uh, people can figure out you're the one <laughs> in this group. Thanks, uh, Kirk. Thank you. Mark Jackson, who in addition to being a terrific singer and sometimes songwriter, is a newly minted novelist with a series of two, soon to be three books on yep. his uh, character Zebediah Creed. The new book is called The Great Texas Dance. And Mark, that's published by whom? It's published by Five Star uh, Cengage Publishing. And he's also the author. Uh, he's currently writing a series called Butch and Sundance, The Last Great Outlaws of the Old West for the podcast Legends of the Old West. Yep. Podcasts are great. Hopefully we'll be able to talk about them in this. Yep. J.R. Sanders, there in the dark, uh, is originally from Newton, Kansas, and a, a lifelong student of uh, the uh, realities and myths of the Old West. He's authored books on topics as diverse as Southern California apple farmers and Old West lawmen killed in the line of duty. His most recent book, very recent, uh, in March 2020, published by Level Best Historia Books, is a detective novel set among the B-movie productions of 1930s Hollywood. So a very diverse group. Welcome to you all. So Thank you. I want to start with a, a general question. Let's try to get a handle on the steamer trunk word, the West, because I think most people tuning into this are going to have a stereotypical or archetypal view of what a Western constitutes. So I'd like to ask you each in turn, how do you define the West that you write about? I think we'll start with Deanne. Well, for me, it is, of course, a physical place, but it's also a mythological place. And I think that is so for uh, America itself. I mean, the Wild, the wild West is our address. That's where we, we live. Um, our founding documents contain the word freedom innumerable times and um, you know they inform our scripture it's a free country I can do what I want don't fence me in I mean all of that comes right out of the wild west and that's all something I explore in every single one of my books which are literally set in the west and the desert is often a main character but I think that the uh, cowboys and Indians uh, ethos that we all grew up with is something that informs our lives in every way. And we see it playing out right now, uh, you know, every day. JR, your thoughts? Um, to me, it's a, it's a place first and foremost, uh, a frontier typically, most often literally a frontier, but sometimes more in a figurative sense. Um, but a place where people are seeking to build a new life they're in unfamiliar territory dealing with uh, the harsh elements that come with that unfamiliar territory. Mm -hmm. uh, elements could be weather, could be geographic, um, societal elements. Um, but just dealing with the, the challenges of living in a, in a new environment and learning to cope and learning to function and, and, in some cases, building a new society or adapting. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, traditionally the West has been drawn by the Mississippi River. Uh, I, I, I suspect that if we go farther back than that uh, to uh, the 13 colonies, the West at one time was um, what is now West Virginia and Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, so the West, the West is ever changing. Um, it, it's a, it's a direction pointing toward, um, uh, I, I, I think what Deanne said was, was freedom. Everybody wanted to be free and that created a, a traditionally or stereotypically rugged individual, uh, men and women that literally had to um, survive, at least in the beginning, uh, the, the, new, the new pioneers and frontiers, uh, front, the frontiers men and women that went out, uh, survive totally on their own uh, wit, 
spirit, um, spunk is a good word, uh, or else you'd die. It's, it was as simple as that. Uh, the mortality rates, uh, I don't think, are talked about in your traditional Western, um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know what the, st the statistics are, but children died um, quite often. That's why they had so many kids. Um, but it was a place of uh, uh, harshness and beauty and also a place where you could uh, make uh, oneself into uh, a, a true, true person, individual or family and build a dynasty. So, so let's, you know, we're using a lot of, using a lot of past tense in describing the West, but I think, you know, we all agreed that a Western need not be confined by a particular era, the, the era that the so-called cowboy era that people are so familiar with was only a very, very small portion of the, the evolving Western history. There was a lot more that came before and certainly a lot more that came after. And I wonder if you would address that. I'll throw that out to the panel. Anybody who wants to, to start that, that response. Well, I would say that the, back to what I was saying earlier, the, um, you know, this idea of freedom, which is fueled by our wide open spaces is something that we've all been promised since day one and, and we seek. And, but of course that promise is not, is denied to some, it's not readily available to everyone. And that's something I explore in every single one of my books. Um, whether I'm writing about uh, wild horses and the wars against them and what they represent and why are we a cowboy nation destroying the horse we rode in on? What is, what's that all about? That's the subject of Mustang um, in 29 Palms, my book that Hunter Thompson praised. That's about two girls who were killed by a Marine after the Gulf War in 29 Palms, California. And that, takes a look at um, who lives in the desert and why, and um, a fatal collision between uh, some rootless kids, a very diverse group of kids, I might say, white, black, Samoan, Latino, Filipina, and, uh, and some Marines. And, and how did that happen? And what forces brought all these people together in the Mojave? That's something I get into in 29 Palms and again, and in Desert Reckoning as well, which as you mentioned is based on, on a Rolling Stone piece of mine. And um, it takes place in the Antelope Valley, north of LA, which is where that terrible uh, hanging of the black man occurred recently. Uh, and my book is about who, again, who's living in rural areas and why. And it is, it's about a hermit who killed a cop and the, forces that brought them together in the Wild West. And for the for those two characters, the Wild West of the frontier era, what, it was really where they were living inside their heads. I mean, um, they talked about it. They uh, wanted to be in the Mojave because they had been informed by um, uh, Zane Gray books and all sorts, you know, every, you named the myth about the frontier and they were shaped by it and lived it. Let me, uh, let me throw that over to JR as well. I mean, just picking up on what Deanne's talking about, do you see these, these themes of, you know, mm -hmm. the West as they've come down in the American consciousness continuing to inform our experience? Very much. I mean, and, and Mark kind of alluded to the, to the earlier West of, uh, when when the west was still east of the mississippi mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the the western tradition started with writers like james fenimore cooper and yeah. uh, legends about people like daniel boone davy crockett uh and it's evolved over the years through you know ned buntline and and <laughs> bill cody mythologized the west while they were still living in it uh and a lot of what they they built up as myth is still with us today and still informs a lot of Western writing and films and television. Um, and then it evolved on, on through the years, the silent film era, you know, Tom Mix, William S. Hart, 
William S. Hart was, was maybe one of the ones in the early days who tried to, to inject a little bit more realism uh, and get away from the, the mythologized version. Um, That's true. While still being entertaining. Um, yeah, Hell's Hinges is one of the great silent films and it's, it's, it's oh, realistic yeah. and violent. Yeah. Very, very, uh, really ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, Mark, do you uh, have any additional thoughts on that? Well, by the time the uh, the cowboy era came came about, uh, most of those guys were twenty five percent of them were ex slaves. As a matter of fact, um, mm. so I think that had some to do with, um, uh, and the fact that 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 has never been addressed really uh, in any cowboy film that I'm aware of, uh, any any series. I think uh, even Lonesome Dove had Danny Glover played the only, only black cowboy, um, in the whole thing. He was, and he was a cook. <laughs> he, he was a cook. Yeah. So, uh, I think uh, the stereotype that we're still that we deal with today is just that, still a stereotype. Um, and to 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 dig down, and and really get to uh, some some real historical events and situations uh, I think is beginning to happen. I do that with my book, uh, The Great Texas Dance. Um, about halfway through, uh, my, I write with my mother. It's a very interesting relationship, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but she called me out of the blue one day and she said, hey, what do you know about the Order of the Lone Star? And I said, I don't know. I'm, you know, driving to work. And so I started digging. The first, the first site that came up on Google was uh, a white supremacist uh, thing, and then I found out that it was the forerunner for the um, the, the secret society of the golden what is it golden circle that really was the the the, the push towards the Confederacy and secession of the southern states, and these these are folks that wanted to create uh, countries not. Uh, around the entire um, Caribbean and Central and South America. That was the Golden Circle. Well, the forerunners were an organization called the Order of the Lone Star. And there were folks out of New Orleans that financed, helped finance the Texas Revolution because they, the Mexicans were to abolish slavery and they, uh, they didn't like that. So they revolted. I've never heard that, that reason before in any of the Alamo books or stories. And but technically so, they were illegal squatters. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, yeah. It, and if you read the Texas constitution that came about by the founding of that Republic, uh, it was the, it, it was the blueprint for the Confederacy uh, constitution. So when I found that out, and then I, my character, who's kind of humming along, going, you know, escapes from Goliad and does all this, and he gets to the Grosse Plantation, and he realizes that, holy smokes, this is not about uh, land or freedom or anything. It's about, it's about maintaining the industry of slavery and maintaining the industry of, of uh, cotton. And, uh, and in order to do that, they had to... Uh, maintain slavery well let's i'm going to put that in my book that's no, gonna, the great texas dance that's the title <laughs> so i'm going to jump ahead with some like because i want to get back and talk to you all about the importance and dm mentioned it in her introductory remarks that that, that land and place plays in, in the writing that we do but because this has you know gotten very interesting about the contemporary relevance of western mythology let me phrase the question this way. What responsibility does the Western as a genre and U.S. Western writers have um, to tell these stories that haven't been told before, particularly as the audience is now much more diverse and much more savvy than it was in the days of Zane Grey, Louis L'Amour, etc.? Dan, you want well, to start with that? Yeah, sure, because the characters in, in my books have uh, been diverse since I started writing, and not because I was cruising around looking for diverse characters, but the, the, <laughs> stories, the stories I tell really call me. 
and um, I can't shake them. And sometimes they whisper in the dark and sometimes uh, they're banging on my door, but I tell them because I just really can't shake them. So as I mentioned with 29 Palms, I have a, I have a very wide ranging group of characters and um, uh, I do in uh, Blood Brothers, of course, which you were mentioning earlier about Sitting Bull and Buffalo Bill and their time together in the Wild West show. And Annie Oakley is in that as well. And um, I, I really take a look at this strange alliance that those two characters had and this bloody history that they shared. And I got into it because while I was working on Mustang, I found out that Cody had given Sinning Bull um, a, 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 the horse that he rode in Buffalo Bill's show when he wanted to return to Standing Rock after four months touring with Cody. And several years later, um, when Sinning, I learned that what when while Sinning Bull was being assassinated, that that horse was tied up outside Cody's cabin and it started to dance at the sound of gunfire because that's, right. that's what it had been trained to do in the Wild West show. And I, I just, again, here, this image just called me and I couldn't shake it and I wanted to go inside that and find out how that all came together and, and what Sinning Bull was doing in, in Cody's show. And... Um, to get that, I know that's a long way of answering your question. What responsibility mm -hmm. do we have as writers in terms of telling certain stories? And what I did with that book, and, I, and I'm certainly well aware that I was writing about two icons who had been written about, you know, a lot to a great degree before I got into it. Um, but I wanted to say something new about them and what this mm -hmm. strange and unexpected alliance was all about. And I went back and into the archives and, and found out found out about a book uh, about Sitting Bull written by his great grandson Ernie Lapointe, which came out about ten years ago. And none of the other histories I had read about Sitting Bull referred to that book. Now, admittedly, it came out years after a lot of the other histories, but but still, none of that had been included. And I did. Um, you know, make a point of incorporating that information into what I told. And, and I also unearthed some stories about Cody that people aren't, uh, aren't really aware of, which is the fact that his father was an abolitionist during the Civil War. And when I talk about these things at my talks, I'm often approached at the end after uh, after other people have left, I'm approached by individuals one by one who want to talk privately about what they've learned. I mean, mm -hmm. for instance, in Cody, Wyoming, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I was taught in school that Sitting Bull killed Custer. And thank you for s pointing out that that's not what happened. So, yeah, that, that, that's what I'm sort of getting at, the way our perception of things is very yeah. different from the reality. I mean, uh, this idea of finding a new spin um, Jay, you're doing that with the new book, this idea of a, of a, it's not a Western, it's not a noir, but it's a combination of the two in an area even of classical Western history that a lot of, a lot of people don't know about. What led you to that sort of approach? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not per se a, a fiction writer. I, this is actually my first novel. All my previous stuff, for the most part, has been nonfiction. And... Uh, rather than, than plunge right in and try to write a traditional Western, I wanted to do something a little off kilter that still touched on some of those traditions, but uh, that gave a, a different perspective or came from a different viewpoint. And I'm also a big fan of, uh, of detective fiction, the classic uh, noir, you know, Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett. Um, so I wanted to do something along those lines and I, the more I thought about it, why not kind of combine the two? Uh, 1930s, 40s was a real heyday for the B Western. Republic was was yeah. you know grinding those things out, you know, every few days it seemed, and uh, and then people like Gene Autry were were you know superstars. John Wayne was 
just on the verge of becoming a superstar. And uh, it, it was an interesting way to, to contrast to um, Los Angeles at that time, the urban Los Angeles yeah. um, that was very corrupt at the time. The government was corrupt. The police were corrupt. The whole system was, was very corrupted. But contrasting that urban Los Angeles with the rural area that, that lay just outside, just north of LA, you had New Hall, uh, Chatsworth, Vasquez Rocks, places where these Western movies were being filmed, these iconic scenes, you know, that we think of as, as sort of quintessential Wild West scenes were being shot half an hour, you know, 45 minutes from downtown metropolitan LA. Um, and then just at the time, the, the, uh, a lot of the B-movie cowboys, particularly the bit players and the stuntmen that were used, the horse wranglers and so on, were guys who, who had been real life cowboys mm -hmm. in the Midwest and the Southern states. Uh, a lot of them came from Oklahoma and Texas because of the Dust Bowl migration. Mm -hmm. And it was a way for them not only to keep food on the table, but to continue that cowboy tradition that they had grown up with and, and had lived. Um, Kirk, can I just add, could I add sure, one? Yeah, yeah, by all means. Yeah, to, to, to follow up on your question about what, you know, or Marnie had posted this too, I think, what, yeah. how is, what's up with the concept of freedom right now and how is that playing out? And, you know, I was saying earlier, we hear, we, we see it and hear it every day. I mean, whether it's about masks, it's a free country. I don't have to wear a mask if I don't want to. It's a free country. I can um, uh, tear down a statue if I want to. It's a free country. I can go out in the streets and, and proclaim my rights if I want to. I'm not putting, the, putting any of these forth. I'm not issuing a position here. I'm just saying yeah. I'm talking about how our concept and belief in freedom plays out in our daily lives all the time and right now in a really, really big way. I mean, we are examining uh, the Bill of Rights. We're taking a look at who we are as Americans. It's all right here, front and center. Um, it's some, something that, you know, I know we've all been writing about one way or another, but I, I discussed this quite literally in every single one of my books, partly because some of the characters I've written about talk about this stuff themselves. I mean, whether it's right after they've been pulled over for a speeding ticket, but officer, how come you didn't pull over the other guy? Or whether it's because they've just been busted in a knife fight. I have my rights, where's my lawyer? I mean, it's just nonstop. Um, so I think that this question of freedom is always with us. It's the American gospel. Um, and now we're reckoning with what that's all about in every way. Well, that's that, you know, you're going back to that, that myth of the, uh, uh, the wilderness that becomes a garden. It's, you know, what J.R. was talking about. The Western pitched on what, what Frederick Jackson Turner called the, the, uh, the line between civilization and savagery. And the uh, the taming of it, but the uh, the the dichotomy and the the, the conflict underlying all these 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 narratives is uh, that you've got what we call rugged individualism, and then we've got community spirit. And it's interesting how Westerns can spin that on both sides. I think one of the most fascinating things about the series Deadwood, for instance, is that it starts as this toxic battle between personalities who you think are going to kill each other. And by the time it gets around to its conclusion in the movie they made 10 years after the show, it's about how all these guys get together and form a community to throw off uh, George Hurst, the capitalist who wants to transform everything. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, do you deal with that in your work as well, that sort of uh, debate between and the conflict between the individual and society? Uh, I do, because uh, my character, Zebediah Creed, is probably the epitome of, of indi individual. Uh, an indiv he was grown up, he grew up uh, uh, a slave to the, to the Lakota and then became a warrior. And so the first book is, is all about 
him not only seeking revenge, thus the title an eye for an eye, but on how to to navigate through society and and work with others um, at at least in the first book uh, at an individual basis and how to trust someone uh, that uh, that may or may not be trustworthy yet he has to go with this guy in order to uh, get through this underworld that had that that had been created at the fringes of society at that time it was St. Louis and New Orleans is that and um, he had to uh, he had to put aside his the idea that he could do it himself in order to to uh, uh, get to where he needed to go to find the guy that that killed his brother right and uh, and he 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 had to navigate uh, this society that was something alien to him and and that's that's a huge part of part of the story that i tell so and 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 all the stories that you know, certainly in, in all the books with this with our group here there is a certain amount of journey there's a certain amount of travel there's a certain amount of of people who are embedded into their landscape and i think when you know you talk to western writers and even those like, you know, the great Max Evans, who doesn't consider himself a Western writer because yeah. he's writing about ordinary people in everyday lives and that happen to live in the West. It's always how he defines it. Um, it's still that sense of that sense of place and territory is so important. And Jerry, maybe we start with you. If you could talk a little bit about how the land defines the people and the subject matter. Well, again, I think it goes back to the to the struggles and the conflicts that, that come with living in uh, an unfamiliar land, or an alien land. Um, and again, it's not, I'm trying to get my thought here. I think about Star Trek, <laughs> of all things. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I recall going boldly where no man's gone before. Yeah, I recall back in the day hearing Star Trek described as wagon train in space, mm -hmm. uh, and and really, you know, if you look at it, especially the early show, the original show, that's what it was. Yeah. So, and it doesn't have to be that physical frontier that we typically think of as as a Western locale. Uh, it's more about the experience and and the relationships and the the struggle of the people who are living in this environment um you know a more modern example would be the mandalorian which is again you know set in space but very much a western very much uh thematically and and uh almost in some some episodes even geographically a western and, uh I want to get back to that too because I want to I want to bring in at some point. I know it's strange as may sound. I want to bring in uh, Spike Lee's new film, *The Five Bloods*, which relies very much on Western tropes, but it, it pitches everything in, in Vietnam. But uh, Dan, your books are um, heavily anchored to a particular kind of landscape. The landscapes are harsh and unforgiving, and it tends to to breed a very independent, rugged kind of personality. I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. Sure. Well, I write about the desert, um, as you know, and it's not just harsh and unforgiving. There, are, There's incredible beauty in the desert and unexpected uh, bursts of um, grace and, and life. And, and that's kind of, that informs my stories and, and, and how my characters move in the desert. Um, I think that our wide open space, and this goes back to, again, our American idea of freedom, this why our wide open spaces in, in the desert west uh, drives this idea. It's our idea of freedom comes out of um, space, you know, unfettered space mm -hmm. and what, how we move through it and in it and what have we done to it and to ourselves, this schizophrenia, you know, we, 
we love our wilderness, but we dam it up. We, um, we whack wild animals. You know, we're building a wall at the border. We try to control it. What, what is this schizophrenia all about? It's connected to our failure to honor any of our treaties with Native Americans. This is all part of a piece. Um, all of this has played out in our un, once unfettered wide open spaces. And that discussion, that, that's a discussion that we're still having. Um, should we take dams down on rivers? Should we build more? You know, again, it's all about controlling what's wild and what's free in our connection with that. So that's something I take a look at, you know, in my stories, which, which do happen to be set in the desert, which I love. And I, I want to talk about my own personal connection with the desert. I grew up on the mostly frozen shores of northeastern Ohio in Cleveland, and um, I never much took to it, although I, I love garage bands. But uh, my father used to read Edgar Allan Poe to me a lot as a kid, and you all, I'm sure, are familiar with his great poem, El Dorado. And I started living inside that poem as, as a child, as a way of escape. I really wanted to uh, get out of Ohio, and, I, and that became kind of uh, – uh, my go-to point, you know, the ride boldly, ride sunshine and in shadow. Ride boldly, ride, ride boldly, ride. And I did grow up around horses. My mom was one of the first women in the country to ride professionally on the racetrack as an exercise boy. So all of this came together for me, riding and wanderlust, and one, and and I found a place I could escape to, which happened to be the West. You know, um, the classic American dream, and and. And I did head on out of Dodge one day and, and found a new Dodge. <laughs> so, that's, you know, that's where I kind of remained. Um, I, wait, well, I'm, I, I just want to answer Marnie's question about archives. Somebody is asking about, was asking yeah. about my get there. to Go archives. Ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, my books all include extensive bibliographies. That's what I meant. That's what my archives are. Yeah. The, that's what I meant by the archives. I go into tr traditional and not so traditional archives, and I list all my sources in my book. In my yeah, let's follow up on that, though. Mark, I mean, as a fiction writer, um, in somebody who's working in hist historical fiction, mm -hmm. how important is the research process to you? What, how does it manifest itself? Research is everything. As a matter of fact, uh, oftentimes the research that I do uh, will – decide the story that I end up with. Um, a good example is I have a character in the first book named Frenchie, and he runs the uh, Frenchie's Emporium in St. Louis. And this is where Zeb has to go to find the murderers of his brother. And that's who Billy Freeze, his buddy that he doesn't really trust, takes him. Well, later on when I'm writing, and, and this is a story of Zeb starting in the up the lower Missouri river where the incident happens and takes him all the way to new Orleans. Well, by the time I get to new Orleans to write that piece, I read a little bit about, um, the pirate Jean Lafitte. And there is an interesting, uh, document uh, that really hasn't been proven, uh, to be a fraud, but it's not quite the, um, the authentic piece, and it's not quite fact yet. Uh, yeah, well, historical fiction, and I know because I do it as well, it, it, we live in that gray area between truth and fiction. So. Right, right. And I found out that Jean Lafitte may have lived in St. Louis in 1835, where this, this sort of story is set. And so I thought, well, I'll just take the leap that Frenchie is indeed Jean Lafitte. And what that did was that, that set up the entire uh, climax of the book to then carry it into not the second book because Zeb goes to the Tex Texas Revolution, but the third book. I'm able to bring Frenchie back, who is now Jean Lafitte, and continue the story. If I had not ever found that out, uh, the, 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 at least this ending that I ended up with would never have been written. That's a great example of, of the research that I've, I've been able to do. And 
So that's it. That's does that answer your question? It does. It does. And so I just just to follow that up, and I'll I'll move it over to, to Jr. for a second. What um, I know you can't write a book about a theme. You can't write about a con a concept. Let's write a book about slavery in the Old West. Well, it's impossible. You can find individual people that personified that debate. But um, are you drawn to a particular kind of story because of its impact, its theme? No, not really. No, no. Uh, I, I've I've written two books. The two two books of the of the series. I'm working on the third right now. Um, it's it started out. The whole thing really started out as a dream that I had. Uh, that's where I found Zebediah Creed, and uh, I I wrote a little short little short story for a class actually for San Diego Writers Inc. And it was 600 word little short story. And I just kept writing. And it, I had no idea what the story was going to be, going to be about. I somehow said it in 1835, which was through research, I found out was an amazing time in our history. And my mantra is that anything that I write, everything, it, it must ring true. In other words, if I need to know about, um, say, for instance, the duels in New Orleans in 1835, I'm going to place the duel that Zeb has in my book at the Oaks, which is now the New Orleans City Park. And that's where they dueled. And I'm not going to put it some other place other than that, because that's where they did it in 1835. So you mean ring true emotionally to you as an author, but also ring true in terms of the detail as well. Yes, absolutely. Right. It's the details. And I'm, I, I write first person narrative. So I place you right there with Zeb. So Jr. I see you, I see you nodding there uh, as well. Um, there are overarching themes in the West, you know, land and water being one, uh, what Deanne's been talking about that, that, that sense of individualism, the constant conflict between the established settlements and the newcomers. You can trace the through line, I think, from the, the mountain men right to Ammon Bundy. You know, that, that, that's, that sense of things. Um, what motivates you to uh, write a particular story? I'm not motivated so much by necessarily by themes or, or uh, places even. Uh, I'm 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 drawn to offbeat stories, uh, untold stories. Mm -hmm. Some of the sort of unexplored corners of the of the West or the Western experience. Uh, I do a lot of magazine pieces for uh, Western history magazines, and I've done stories on things like uh, the roller skating craze in the mid 1880s, uh, and how that swept from east to west and. Mm -hmm. You had cowboys on roller skates, and it became a, a real thing for a while. Wow. Uh, I did a story last year on uh, what were called the resurrection men, uh, people who robbed graves for profit, sold cadavers to medical schools. And again, uh, all across the West, this was going on. And the, those are the sort of things that attract me, just those sort of unexplored little pockets that aren't really written much about. That's, I think that's, that's, that's a common theme I'm hearing from everybody. Dan, we just got a question, too, about um, whether or not, as a writer of Westerns, of modern, the modern West, you, you uh, think about climate change. Oh, sure, I do. I write a lot about the environment. I, I, I've written for, I have a piece that just came out a couple of weeks ago in, in The Independent, which you all can look up about um, the pandemic and the fact that uh, birds have raptors and birds have returned with all the traffic off the roads now in Los Angeles and elsewhere. And we've been reading about this around the world. Um, so yes, that, uh, you all could check my letter from the West columns on uh, the LA review of book site and also on truth dig. And I, I've been writing about environmental issues for years. I, Again, I don't, it's not that I go cruising for certain stories. Um, these things are, these are just, I have an affinity for, for 
uh, the stories I tell and for the land and place as we've been talking about is a big part of my life and um, and my work and the stories I tell. So, so yes, I write about climate change, but not because I think I must, because right. it's right. part of my our world. Yeah, I think it's important that people hear you say that because there's this sense, I think, that writers write to express a particular point of view when often we start with the story and it takes a totally different road as we move through the narrative. Um, I did, yeah. that, what I write about expresses my own view of things. Um, by the way, I should mention I'm teaching a power of place writing workshop in Taos. Speaking of Taos, next month, you could go to the Taos Writers Conference website and find out more about it. I, I assume that's virtual. Uh, New Mexico. On, once again, on Zoom, where else? Yeah. Well, yeah. let me, uh, let me just, this, like, I'll say, go, go ahead, Mark, sorry, go ahead, didn't mean to cut you off, yeah. Just real quick, I, I think if you tell a good story, a great story, and you do your history right, and you do, uh, you, you get it right, I think the theme will emerge. It's oftentimes, uh, Ray Bradbury said this, I, I think, I, I can't quote him exactly, but he said oftentimes it takes a couple of years to realize what the hell you wrote about. Yeah. And I, I, I find that for me and my two little books that I've written to be true. And um, so, I, and oftentimes maybe we have to give it to the reader f to find out. So. Um. Yeah, let me start uh, with this. We're getting we're getting a lot of questions in. We're not going to have enough time to get to all of them. But um, what stories, what untold stories are out there that have that, that you know attract you? What what you know? What would you like to be telling if you had another story to write tomorrow? What you know? What area is unexplored? I'm sorry, Kirk. Was that for me? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wow. <laughs> I've got a file literally bulging with some of these things. Uh, it's hard to single out one. So I'm not asking you to reveal any professional secrets. Oh, so sure. just what you want your part. I appreciate that. No, I, uh, I did a book a few years ago on, uh, it was called Some Gave All. Uh, forgotten Old West lawmen who died with their boots on. And it was sort of a reaction against the cult of Wyatt Earp. You know, mm. When we talk about Old West icons, uh, you probably can't get any more iconic than Wyatt Earp. You know, he's he's sort of become an archetype unto himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I got really tired of this idea that you couldn't have a discussion about Old West lawmen and law and order without Wyatt Earp's name springing right to the forefront. Uh, when really, in my opinion, and I, I get in trouble saying this, but uh, go ahead. I love it. <laughs> he was, uh, as a lawman, highly overrated, in my opinion, uh -uh. And, and far too much has been made of his career as a lawman. He's an interesting personage, no doubt. Uh, brave, courageous, and bold, probably. But uh, in looking at at some of the other lawmen who particularly the ones I focused on in the book were, were guys who were killed fairly early in their careers. So they never had an opportunity to uh, have the kind of notoriety or, or fame that Wyatt Earp enjoyed, you know, in part because he lived to be an old man. Um, and so in terms of un untold stories, I would like to go back and revisit that. I was only able to write about 14 of these officers in the one book. You, know, you have the constraints of, uh, you know, what you can fit between two covers. Um, so at some point, I would like to go back because there are many, many, many of those untold stories yet to, you know, people who just have not been written about and who probably should have been written about who deserve to be remembered. Yeah, Dean, you were mentioning that in terms of uh, your research on the um, on the Blood Brothers book, isn't it often what happens that we start looking at these iconic characters and then as we peel back some of the layers, you find these other people that, wait, who is this? As you found the, the, the memoir that nobody had really referenced before that gives us a new window into understanding these people. Yeah, while working on Blood Brothers in particular, I, I found 
so many people whose stories should be told, you know, not just in a footnote somewhere, but, you know, really deserve full on treatment. I do um, tell the story of Wavoka in Blood Brothers and others have as well too, but I, I, I think that I have a kind of a new take on him in my book, but I, I would like to look into his story much more. I mean, I describe him in Blood Brothers as, um, you know, was he, uh, was he Jesus Christ? Was he Steve Wynn, the Steve Wynn of his era? Was he just some guy in a gulch with a sign? I mean, he did seem to be kind of a, a pretty serious con man who ended up causing a lot of damage in terms of his ghost dance prophecy. But yet, years later, people still believe what he was saying and <clears throat> did, did uh, claim to have witnessed some of his miracles. So I think he's a fascinating character in, in, his, in our history, and he, he's somebody I'd like to, to, to know more about myself. How about you, Mark? You found Jean with Pete. Is there, did that lead you anywhere else? Uh, no, but it was very interesting writing, uh, the Texas revolution. Um, a lot of the stereotypes were, were true. Uh, Fannin and Goliad was insane. Um, and I was able to, to express that through, it's very interesting writing through from first person, uh, perspective is, is that all we, all we get is Zeb's story. And, um, so some people think that it's very narrow. I find it very refreshing, and and that it you you dig you do get an opinion, uh, very very uh, an opinion based on experience uh, of of the character's experience. So I was able to um, to go through the the typical you know Travis and the at the Alamo uh, Crockett shows up. You know I got them all in there, um, but. You know, I portray Houston as sometimes he wasn't a good guy, you know, and maybe, maybe I do have him as a stereotype, but there are also aspects of his personality that come out through, through the context of Zeb's relationship with Houston that I think uh, are unique. And, and I'd, I'd like to think so. It, again, it's really up to the reader and, and who uh, to judge. Um, but uh, as far as the story, I'm interested in, in finding out uh, personal histories. Uh, I, I think my, my next book, my fourth book, is going to be about my grandmother and her um, history of robbing banks. Now, did she rob banks in Oklahoma in the late 20s and early 30s? I don't know anything about that, but it sure would be interesting to explore. And, uh, and the fact that uh, her and her sister, my aunt and my grandmother, uh, perceive reality and their perceptions are, are completely different. And to tell those two stories uh, in, a, in a very realistic, um, unromantic way. Well, maybe one's very romantic and one's very not romantic. Um, that story would certainly not be in the history books. Um, but I would be able to portray Oklahoma where I grew up, um, hopefully in a, in a, in a true light at that, for that time period and for today. So, so bef before we go, just one, one last question for me, which is, um, clearly the audience for Westerns, whether you define them as classical, traditional, or contemporary still exists. If you look at the ratings from the third season of the Paramount series Yellowstone, it mm -hmm. was, it broke records for all basic cable shows uh, for any number of years. And that's, it, it's been an ascending path, whether you like the show or not, it's been an ascending path since it debuted three years ago. Um, and we've seen a trend in Western publishing toward both fiction and nonfiction that is now more representative of the overall Western experience. And I'd be curious to ask the panel, do you see any encouraging trends emerging um, in your world of Western writing? Hmm. Oh, I, 
I see the uh, genre expanding. Um, right. You see so the I, genre expanding? Talk about that a little bit, Jerry. Yeah. I do. Well, I think about, uh, again, to talk about TV shows, well, based on books, um, Justified, uh, the Longmire series, both the series of books and the, and the television series. Um, you know, very, very Western, but also very modern. Right. Uh, Deanne? Well, as I was saying earlier, I think the West is America's address. So I don't think, I mean, my books happen to be set in the West. I'm with the um, writer, the novelist you mentioned earlier, and I, for blank, I forgot his name. I'm sure, sorry, the, the novel from, novelist from Taos. We were we were Max Evans. Yes, I agree with it. I mean, for me, you know, I, that's where my books take, happen to take place because I love the landscape. I, I, I don't think I could set my books in the jungle. I'm just not drawn to it. But um, so I can't really speak to the genre. I, I mean, it's always undergoing a so-called comeback, whatever that means. But if you look to a lot of other literature, the stories are pretty classic tales about the same things. Mark, you got a minute before we have to wrap and our hosts come back on. Well, I, I, I think it comes down to simply telling a good story. It always comes back to the story. And, and, and uh, we as Western writers, we love this, this part of our country, this part of our world. And um, I know I, I will continue to set, to set my books, at least for now, uh, west of the Mississippi and um, do my best to make it all ring true. So, Well, great. Thank you, everybody. It's been a great discussion. We could go on for another hour, but this is what we've been allotted. So thank you, and thanks to Jennifer and Marnie and Anastasia. Yeah, thank you. Everybody at the Writers' Festival. Thank you, everyone. For giving thank us everybody. the chance. Great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Kirk. Be thank you. Before you go, I just want to thank you. That was amazing. Kirk, you were fantastic. <laughs> Uh, perfect and uh, all of you I cannot wait I'm so excited to go, go out and read your books and, and I want you to know that we got a comment that said I've been really nervous about writing western because you know so many topics like you touched on how do you write about that and this person said I'm now inspired to write my story that I've been writing, wanting to write for years so, so thank you for bringing your inspiration and your words and, and Mark my daddy is an original Oklahoma cowboy he grew up in the Dust Bowl yeah, and yeah. Um, so I just wanted to like mention that Oklahoma, a little town called Perry. So I, I, yeah, I, I appreciate you and, and no, your tell roots. Him, tell him hello from a fellow Hokie. <laughs> you betcha. You betcha. It's funny. Uh, I grew I, up in um, Arizona and, and uh, there were horses everywhere. And so just listening to this felt like a little piece of home. And I loved how you guys brought in. Uh, contemporary themes and made it fresh and talked about what's coming up next and just, you know, waking up um, our viewers for what's out there and how rich and interesting it is right now. You guys are so fascinating and we, we're going to follow you and, and let everyone know anything you do in the future. Okay, guys, yep. mission accomplished. So, <laughs> accomplished. Oh, and, Thank and you. By the way, the Western Writers of America is the greatest organization I would not be here, would not be published had it not been here. For, uh, for all the great, great folks from around the world that I've met over the years, Kirk and particularly Kirk and I go back uh, a, a few conventions anyway. <laughs> if and, someone wanted to um, get involved, how might they do that? They go under our website, uh, westernwriters.org, and you'll find uh, the history of the organization, a list of award winners, uh, membership forums, what, what's required for membership. It's all there. It's all there. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. You so much, you guys. Publish, yeah, thank you. Publish a book and you can become a member. Awesome. Yay. That's awesome. I want to write a Western easy. so I can be a member. It's that easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's that thank easy. You. Yeah. It's that Just easy. write a book. <laughs> <laughs> Just write a book. Right. Awesome. Y'all have a wonderful day and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.